Hi, everyone. Happy holidays. Welcome to week two of Advent. If you caught my live feed, we were playing with it, so hopefully it wasn't too out of focus. Um, on tonight's show, we're going to talk about hot toddies, some books that you should probably put on your Christmas wish list if you don't already have them. And then we're going to go in just a little bit deeper on their breed study. For those of you that happen to pick up my Advent Fiber Box. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the breeds that were in it up to uh, day nine. I think we're on day nine. Is today nine? I think today is. Whatever the second Sunday of Advent is. We've done this in a number of takes, so I've had quite a few hot toddies. So I'm going to start there. The hot toddy is a wonderful winter drink. It is simply tea, whiskey, and then whatever else you'd like to add into it. Some people add in cloves, cinnamon sticks, lemon, honey, um, pretty much anything that you want to put into it. Uh, for my hot toddy tonight, I've been drinking Fuzzy Wigs tea from St. Louis, Missouri, as well as apple spice whiskey from a distillery just a little bit outside of St. Louis. So um, it's, it's really good. So... The nice thing with hot toddies, too, is they do help um, shorten the common cold. So if you are feeling a little bit congested, trust me, one of these will definitely make you feel better. So the first thing that I want to talk about is your Christmas wish list. If you haven't already put it together, I'm going to recommend three books that I suggest you add to your Christmas wish list. The first one is a tiny one. It would be a perfect stocking stuffer. It is the, fle the Field Guide to Fleece. This is just a handy pocket book that goes through and talks about the characteristics of the different sheep breeds and then a little bit more about them. It is indispensable if you're looking at purchasing fleeces and want to know more characteristics about them. Um, for instance, if you're going to a sheep show and there is an auction for fleeces, this is definitely a book that you want to have on hand. Um, in addition to that, it's by the same authors, the Fleece and Fiber source book. It basically does the same thing. It talks about the same thing, but it's a lot more in-depth. Um, this is kind of like the uh, fleece Bible for spinners, if you if you will. Um, it's it's indispensable. I'm so glad that I've got it in my library. I go to it uh, pretty frequently when I'm looking up breeds and whether or not the fiber that I want to work with is suitable for the project that I have in mind. Um, the last book that I want to talk about is the Spinner's Book of Fleece. Now, this is a little bit shorter book. It doesn't have quite as many breeds in it as the Fleece and Fiber source book, but what it does have in it is an entire front section that talks about how spinners need to prepare fiber for spinning, different ways to spin tools. This is a really great book if you're just getting into processing fleece from right off the animal to the finished product. So if you're interested in doing kind of a fleece to fabric, a sheep to shawl, that type of thing, this is definitely a good book to have in your library. All three of these are wonderful because they showcase and they talk about uh, softness, characteristics. It's one of those things where you don't want to be processing Scottish blackface to give to somebody as a scarf to wear next to skin. By the same token, you don't want to be using baby merino in a rug that's going to go in somebody's bathroom. So these are really good books to have if you are interested in learning more about the characteristics of sheep. So those are the things that need to be on your wish list. For those of you that have taken advantage of the advent calendar, I want to talk a little bit about what I've spun up so far. So day three was thin sheep, and this is how I spun it up. There were, were a lot of nubs in it, and the fiber itself had a lot of character to it. So what I did was I spun it as an art yarn. So my yarn has a lot of character to it. So when I open this up, you'll see there are a lot of thin and thick pieces to it, 
and I was really quite pleased with how this turned out. I struggle when it comes to spinning art yarn because I've been spinning one type for so very, very long. So I was really happy with how this turned out. The next one that I want to showcase is day four. This is the washed Ryland. And Ryland is an incredibly soft breed. It's one of the oldest breeds in England. In fact, it has, according to the, the Fleece and Fiber source book that I looked at, Queen Elizabeth had a pair of stockings made out of Ryland, and they were so soft that she refused to wear any other fiber after that. Now, the nice thing with Ryland is it is a relatively short staple length, and that leads me to what I'm going to talk about next. Um, I did include some raw Ryland. So day five, there was raw Ryland in the advent calendar box. And I want to talk a little bit about how I prepare fiber. And I took this from somebody else. Um, I've prepared fiber incorrectly lots and lots and lots of different times. And so when I saw this out on one of the Facebook groups, I really wanted to take the opportunity to share it with you because as with so many things, if you do all of the preparation on the front end, it's going to make the um, combing and carding after it's washed so much easier. So what I learned was by going through and essentially creating little packets to spin, you're already getting your fleece going in one direction and it's going to stay in one direction. So I've already started processing this. I also want to talk a little bit about the learning curve. Um, if you have the opportunity to look at a fleece before you buy it and to get your hands in it, I would highly recommend it. Unfortunately, a lot of times that isn't the case and there are a lot of opportunities out on the internet to buy fleeces from other people, um, other people that have sheep. And when I bought this Ryland fleece, I bought it sight unseen. And what's unfortunate is, you see, I can pull this tip right off. What that means is there's a break. And there's a couple breaks. So in this particular piece, I have three different breaks. Now, what that means is that unfortunately this sheep wasn't very healthy and either something in the diet, um, stress, something happened that created wool with breaks in it. And so I've got the tips that are a little bit lighter here. And again, when I pull, those tips pull right off, which is a little disheartening. But I'm still left with usable fiber. So it's it's not always a bad thing when it happens, although if you're not expecting it, it can be a little bit frustrating because now, as I said, I'm going to have to go through and pull all of those tips off and make sure there aren't any other breaks. In this particular fleece, there have been a couple pieces where I have found not one but two breaks. So the little packet that I'm creating is probably just about a handful, almost like if you were doing pasta. So if you're getting ready to dump pasta into a pot, that's family-sized portion of pasta. And I'm going to loosely wrap. And this is where the acrylic that I use to tie the packages for each of my little advent bags. So I end up with this little packet, and that's just going to go into my wash tub. And these little wash tubs that you get at the dollar store are absolutely great for processing fiber. So I'm going to go through and finish processing that. The next breed that I want to talk about is the Day 7 breed, which is Hungarian Raka, which if you have the opportunity, look it up online because these are really interesting sheep. They have these amazing curved horns. Not an easy breed to find information on. Um, so again, this is a rare breed. They have very long locks, very high lanolin content, lots and lots of lanolin in these. So I'm going to separate these out a little bit more. Again, I'm going to lay them out. This is an opportunity, too, if for some reason there are second cuts you can pull those tiny second cut pieces out because they're certainly not things that you're going to want to spin. I mean, you can, but you're just going from spinning long fibers to really short fibers. 
So here is a Hungarian Raka packet. Everything is going the same direction. And I will just create this little bundle. and add it to my bucket there. And then the last one that I'm going to talk about is one of my favorite breeds to work with just because the locks are so beautiful. This is um, Raw White Face Dartmoor, which when you look at these locks, it's like doll hair. I mean, they're just amazing to look at. Now with this particular one, I noticed that the tips were a little dirty. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just clean some of that out as well and open up those locks because that, again, is gonna make the washing process go so much smoother. So again, I'm gonna pull these locks These, I've got a little bit of dirt. Open them up. And then I'm gonna put this little packet together as well. All right, I'm going to finish making these packets up, and I'll be back in just a few minutes when I am ready to wash everything. Okay, so now we're in the kitchen, and I have all of these little packets of fluff ready to go. And the soap that I included in the advent calendar, there are lots and lots of different scouring products out there. Unicorn Power Scour is one of the the best that you can buy hands down. What I included in the advent kit was Namaste Farms, which is another fiber and it's of equal value. It, it takes a little bit longer than Unicorn, but this is what I had on hand and I had a whole lot of it. So this is what I included because I wanted to showcase it a little bit. Unicorn gets a lot of press and I think that there is definitely something to be said for Namaste. I actually like Namaste just a little bit better in lower lanolin fleeces because it acts as a little bit of a conditioner. So that's one of the reasons why I included it in the Advent box is because I wanted it to condition the fiber a little bit as well. The nice thing with it, just like with any scouring product that you buy, you only need a little tiny bit. If for some reason you run out and you are processing fleeces, dish, dish washing liquid works just as well. So if you have Dawn that's going to cut through the lanolin um, and just about any of those soaps that will cut grease. Um, that's essentially what we're doing. I mean, that's all we're doing when we scour wool is we're cutting through the lanolin and we're pulling it out to make that spinning just a little bit easier. So I'm just going to put a little bit in my wash tub. Because I'm doing just a small amount, I ran to the dollar store and these little wash tubs are indispensable for washing small quantities of fiber. So I know I am a terrible human being for not measuring, but I don't measure when I cook. I don't measure when I scour fiber. Now, the temperature, I'm not going hot, 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 hot. Um, it's warm, but I can still put my hands in it. I'm not in danger of felting. These, so I will let it bubble up. And just 
set it here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set these little packets down in there. Give them just a little swish. You don't need to, you, you don't want to agitate your fiber. There's lots of, of consensus out there on what you should and shouldn't do when it comes to scouring fiber. If you want the definitive guide for how to scour fiber, uh, Mary of Kamaj Fiber Arts sells a book called How to Scour Like a Boss. And if you really want to know how to get your fiber clean, I highly recommend ordering her book. This is just how I do it. And I'm going to need to put in a little bit more water once I get these guys in here. All right, one of the things I love about white-faced Dartmoor is when it's floating around in there, it looks like little tiny squid. I call them squidlets. I have fiber squidlets. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this soak and I'll come back and check on it in a little while. Now here's the cool thing. So, and this is one of the things that I wanted to show you. Some of the Hungarian raka that I had in here was pretty dirty, but because I went through that little bit of prep where I opened up the fiber, I got some of the dust, dirt, and debris out you'll see I don't have very dirty water at all. And I think that's one of the strongest uh, things I can say for prepping your fiber before you put it in the water. It's going to make rinsing a lot easier and it's going to make the scouring process go just that much more quickly. So why that soaks, I will show you what it looks like when it comes out, because I don't think you want to stand here and watch it wash, although, I don't know, washing fiber soak, washing paint dry and drinking, yeah, we could probably make an argument for that. So here are the what it looks like when it's done and scoured. So here is the washed rylan, and remember, this is what was left after I pulled the tips off. So. Once scoured, I was actually really pleased with it. It's much softer than what I originally thought it would be. It is a shorter staple length than what a traditional Rylan lock would be because in some places I had three breaks, but this is what I ended up with. So I will be able to card that and spin it. And then this is the Raka that cleaned up. There's still a little bit of vegetable matter in there, but otherwise see how white it is compared to what it originally looked like. So there is the raka, and then this is the white face Dartmoor all clean. Now it's still slightly wet, so I will be combing that out. There's a little bit of yellow in there, but you'll see even where it was tied it still came very clean and that's one of the things that I like about putting these little packets together is everything does still come out relatively clean. So I'm going to let that soak and I'm going to get everything ready for the last little bit that I'm going to demonstrate tonight which is Kool-Aid dyeing and I'm going to Kool-Aid dye some of my favorite fiber. So. Alright, so as you can see that little bit of prep I did, I actually have more soap left that's going to make me have to rinse this one more time than dirt. So as I said, doing those little packets with that little bit of prep, so now I can go through with the extra soap and work out if there is vegetable matter, things like that. I can pull that out, set it off to the side. Um, and for the most part, you know, again, uh, I think that you could probably argue that with Unicorn, 
I would have completely white tips here, uh, whereas I'm working a little bit more with the Namaste, but I can already feel how much soft it's soft. So I think it's kind of a six of one, half a dozen of the other. I really like the fact that the Ryland was incredibly dirty. It was a very, very dirty fiber as I was putting it into the packets. I was concerned that I was going to need to do a lot of rinses. And as you can see, this is the second rinse and it's nearly, nearly clear. In fact, I'm gonna have to rinse it again to get rid of the soap, more so than to get rid of the dirt. So I'm gonna dump that. Last little bit. So as I'm doing this, I'm looking forward to spinning most of these. Um, the white face Dartmoor, I probably will not be uh, spinning too much because white face Dartmoor is a little bit like spinning Kevlar. It is an incredibly strong fiber, which makes it wonderful for uh, socks, I would say. It, I, I think it's got a lot of potential. Um, one of the other interesting things about white face Dartmoor, it is on the endangered breed study. It's a hard breed to come by. So I lucked out when I was able to get as much of it as I did. So I'm just doing the final rinse there. Um, if I liked knitting socks, I might actually consider dyeing it and putting it into some socks. I do not. But if you decide to spin up the white face Dartmoor and put it into socks, please let me know how it goes. I would be curious to hear your experience with this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave those sit for just a couple minutes. I'll put them in the salad spinner and spin out as much of the extra water as I possibly can and put them on the drying rack. So the first batch of Kool-Aid dye that I had going is ready to come out. And as you can see, it's one of those things that's kind of up to you. Uh, the fiber has almost taken in all of the water and as I look at it I've got this ring of clear water right here which means this is pretty much as much dye as this fiber is going to take so I'm going to go ahead and take this out and put it through a quick rinse and we'll take a look at it there is a little bit of dirt in there, which is what I think I'm seeing. So, yeah, just a little bit rinsing out. And kind of my test, yeah, my hands aren't red. So this is as much dye as this is going to take. So I'm going to add this to the pile to go through the salad spinner as well. So that is Masham dyed red. I believe that was cherry red. And now I am going to dye the rest of the Masham black cherry. Now most of the kits I put in a red and a green but for this one, I kind of wanted to see what the difference would be with cherry red and black cherry. So for this particular batch, once again, dyeing with Kool-Aid is one of the safest and easiest ways to start playing with, I did it again, I've got dye on my fingers. 
Dying with Kool-Aid is one of the safest and easiest ways to venture into the arena of dying. Acid dyes and some of the other <laughs> citric acid. See, even with citric acid. Um, some of the other dyes that are acid-based, they are very, very, very dangerous. And so you do need to wear uh, ventilation masks, gloves, things like that. Um, with Kool-Aid, it is the citric acid. So if you go online, <laughs> I'm, you can see the citric acid fuming off of there. That's kind of funny. So if you go online, you can actually do a Google search for Kool-Aid dyeing fiber in the microwave. Historically, I've always done it out in the sun, but in 28 degree weather, that's not going to it's not going to work very well. Um, if you're dyeing it in the sun, you're basically just putting the Kool-Aid in the water and you can start blending colors and playing with colors and it's a whole lot of fun. You put it in a baggie, set it out in the sun when the water's clear, the um, fiber has absorbed all of the dye. So Kool-Aid, it has a dye. The citric acid acts as the mordant. That what, that's what's going to hold it. Oftentimes you'll see that um, it's recommended that you soak the fiber in vinegar first, which if you want to, you certainly can. I've tried it both ways and soaking it in vinegar first doesn't make it any more color fast. So usually the only thing that I do, um, sometimes I wash the fiber first, sometimes I don't because I'm doing this in the microwave. I'm basically going to be cooking out a lot of this dirt. So what I'm going to do is just wet the fiber and I am using pretty, pretty warm water. And as you can see, I'm kind of cleaning it as well. So I am getting some of the dirt out. And I'm going to give it a gentle squeeze. And then I'm going to set it into the die. And press it down. Now I'm going to microwave it just in short bursts. And I'm going to start with just a two minute burst. And then I'm going to let it cool a little bit. Uh, if you don't let it cool down, it will have a tendency to start to boil and bubble over. You also definitely want to cover your bowl before you put it in the microwave. So I have a handy little plastic cover that's going to keep my microwave from looking like I killed somebody in it. Yeah, I learned that the hard way. So in two minutes, we'll see what it looks like, and we'll see what the difference between the cherry red and the black cherry looks like. Thank you for tuning in tonight on The Sip and Spin. I hope you had fun. We talked a little bit about hot toddies, which are a great way to beat the winter cold. I showcased a couple St. Louis area products. One is the Apple Amber Whiskey from Pinkney Bend Distillery, and the other is Fezziwig's Tea. Both are available online, so please check them out. And then I talked a little bit about three books that you should put on your Christmas wish list if you don't already have them in your collection. And I talked about how I prepare fiber for washing, and I did a little bit of dyeing with Kool-Aid. And again, if that's something that you want to get involved in or just want to start playing with, by all means, check it out on websites. Um, pretty much everything that I've shown you this evening is easily accessible through a Google search. Um, the breeds that I showcased were Raw Rylan, which is a breed that's common in England. It was one of Queen Elizabeth's favorites. The other was Hungarian Raka, which I chose because it's a really cool looking sheep. They've got curved horns. And then finally, white face dart more. It's an incredibly strong fiber, long locks. I would highly recommend spinning it or blending it in with other fibers for socks. And then Masham is what I chose to dye. And so this is, these haven't dried yet, but this just gives you a little bit of an idea of what I worked with this evening. 
So what I'll do is I'll let these dry and then I'll spin them up. And I hope you had a lovely second Sunday of Advent and I'll see you next Sunday. Thank you so much for tuning in.